What's up, everybody? Today's live, we're going to go over the ACSM position stands, which um, are the guidelines for most personal training certifications, for most um, exercise curriculum at the university level. So a couple of researchers went through the position stands for the ACSM and found that most of them were either wrong, not backed by any evidence, or the evidence that were presented for these position stands, such as things like free weights are better than machines, you need to lift fast to beat fast, things like that. These are the position stands. And when these researchers looked into the evidence that the ACSM provided for their position stands, they found that either there was no evidence and it was merely an opinion, or the evidence they found didn't actually support them. So I wanted to go over this because when a personal trainer believes something or a coach believes something, it's not really their fault because it's what they were taught. You know, you take the ACE or the NASM or the CSCS certifications, you, you're going to trust that what they're teaching you is correct. Of course you would. But believe it or not, most of it isn't. And these researchers went in, dug in to the recommendations given in these certifications and found there's, there's no evidence behind them. And what they provide as evidence doesn't even support their position stance. So here's a paper I'm going to share with you. and We're going to go over it. This is really cool. So if you guys want to check this paper out, you know, the, the, the sad part is it kind of leads you down a rabbit hole of distrust and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, <clears throat> so the paper is called A Critical Analysis of the ACSM, American College of Sports Medicine, Position Stand on Resistance Training. The conclusion is insufficient evidence to support recommended training protocols. So what are the ones they talk about? So all right, let's just read the abstract. In February 2002, the American College of Sports Medicine, we're reading up here, published a position stand entitled Progression Models and Resistance Training for Elderly Adults. The ACSM claims that the programmed manipulation of resistance training protocols, such as the training modality, rep duration, range of repetitions, number sets, frequency, hyper frequency of training will differentially affect specific physiological adaptations such as muscular strength, hypertrophy, power, and endurance. So if you guys have ever taken the NASM, which I did 10 years ago, you'll see in the beginning of the uh, certification, we'll talk about this training for hypertrophy, this training for power, this training for strength, this training for um, endurance. They say this in the NASM, National Association of Sports Medicine, I believe it's called. That personal training certification literally says this, and it comes from ACSM guidelines. So this is their recommendation, recommendation that there's different training for muscular strength, different training for hypertrophy, different for power. And we're going to get into power because that's complete bullshit, and for endurance. But when you look in to their position stands, there's no evidence behind it. They're merely opinions. Um, so that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about these kinds of, of position stands. So let's, let's go. One of the, one of the big ones is free weights versus machines. And this is where that myth comes from. It's, it's a shame, but so as you can see, uh, the third section here, starting on page three, free weights versus machines. So let's go with there. So the ACSM position stand claims that multi, multiple joint exercises such as bench press and squat are generally regarded as most effective for increasing overall muscular strength because they enable a greater magnitude of weight to be lifted. Now, immediately that should be, <laughs> that should have some alarms going off. The, the, the amount of weight lifted has nothing to do with the stimulus. What we're looking for is resistance. The weight provides resistance, but there are a bunch of things provide resistance. If you're using a machine, the amount of friction in the guide rods, that's part of the resistance. The moment arm is part of the resistance. 
the velocity is part of their resistance. If, if you move a little slower, you're going to be providing more resistance on the targeted muscle tissue because you're reducing the um, assistance of momentum. So the weight has nothing to do with it. Weight is just a factor in providing resistance. And consider this. You know, you can do a static squat. You can get on a leg press, put all the weight on, and push against it as hard as you can until your muscles die out. And you would have worked your muscles, but you would not have lifted anything. So this is just ridiculous. So only one review by Stone et al. is cited in an attempt to support this claim. So the ACSM, which is responsible for creating a lot of curriculum, a lot of university level um, exercise degrees, states that exercises such as bench press squat are generally regarded as most effective for increasing overall muscular strength because they enable a greater magnitude of weight to be lifted. They include one review by this guy for their position stand in an attempt <laughs> to support that claim. So let's go deeper. The position stand claims that resistance exercise machines are safer to use, easier to learn, yep, allow the performance of some exercises that may be difficult with free weights, help stabilize the body, and focus on the activation of specific muscles. So the only reference they get for that is by Ferran, which is a brief opinion about machines that says nothing related to and therefore does not support the opinions expressed in the position stand. So the position stand claims that resistance training with free weights results in a pattern of intra and intramuscular coordination that mimics the movement requirements of specific task. That emphasis should be placed on the free weight exercises for advanced resistance training with machine exercises used to complement the program. There is no reference cited to support any of that. Okay. So... When they say multiple joint exercises of bench press or squat are more effective for increasing muscular strength, they provide one source. We'll go into the source that they provide. They also give all these uh, opinions about machines with one reference. And that reference that they give these uh, opinions about machines, again, are brief opinions about machines, no facts. And this is where the belief that machines are, are inferior to free weights come from, okay? So here's, here's, what they, here's what they provided. Only a few studies have compared, this, this isn't even the position stand, this is just studies in general. So the three position stand, one, free weights are better for overall muscular strength, two, um, exercise machines um, focus on specific muscles, help stabilize the bodies, um, can provide exercises that are difficult with free weights, no evidence. And the other one, that free weights help mimic the movements of other activities, and um, therefore they're better because they'll transfer to your ability to do other activities while there is absolutely no reference cited for that position stand, okay? So those are the three with no evidence or one, one study to support each one. But we're talking about free weights versus machines. The researchers go in to say, only a few studies have compared the effects of free weights and machines on muscular strength. Boyer randomly assigned 60 previously untrained females to one of three resistance training programs. All subjects performed three sets of 10, um, 10 RM, meaning the last repetition denotes a maximal effort on the last repetition of the set. Week th one through three, three by six, week four through six, three by eight, week seven through 12. On two lower body and five upper body exercises. They exercise similar muscle groups using free weights, Nautilus machines or solo flex machines. So they use all different kinds of machines, which utilize rubber straps for resistance. Those things are fucking horrible. I hated those. There was significant pre- to post-training decrease in thigh and arm um, 
body fat for the free weight Nautilus and Soloflex groups with no significant difference between groups when it came to fat loss. Okay. So three groups, one group used free weights, one group used Nautilus machines, one group used that stupid ass Soloflex thing. The reduction in fat mass was the same. Okay. So, so far free weights are not better than machines. <clears throat> The free weight group showed significantly greater than the knowledge group when tested on equipment used for one rep max bench press. Duh. If you practice the bench press, you're going to be better at the bench press. Um, the Nautilus group showed significantly greater gains in the free weight group when tested on Nautilus machines. Duh. So you can see where specificity happens. You know, I've been saying for the past two years. If you want to get better at the bench press, you have to practice the bench press. The same applies for the Nautilus. The free weight group was not able to do as much weight on the Nautilus machine because they weren't practicing it. The Nautilus group wasn't able to do as much on the bench press as the free weight because they were not practicing it. That's how specific skill is. They both got stronger, but you're going to be able to do more weight on the machine you practice. See, it says it right there. Um... All right. Overall, the average strength gain in the free weight group was 20%. Um, Nautilus group increased 26%. Interesting, the Soloflex group significantly increased by 29% when tested on Soloflex machine and 15.1 when tested on other modalities. All right. Before I conclude that although the strength gains were significantly greater when each group was tested on their training modality, because obviously it was skill transfer, um, the programs produced comparable changes in muscular strength and body composition. So what they found was the overall strength improvement was the same. No significant difference between all of it, but the group that tested their strength on the machine that they had been using all along showed greater improvement. This is why you cannot use the bench press as a test of strength because individuals who practice the bench press are going to be able to move more weight. All right, so that's one of the positions. Stand. Does anyone have any questions about that? Let's see. In order to get a job at a gym, you need a certificate uh, certification. Okay to get one knowing it's garbage, but after that, where does a trainer turn to learn the correct way of training? Where do you turn? Um, you got to learn from me, <laughs> honestly. I'm, I'm kind of the only one who's talking about this. Um, you could... Drew Bay... Me, Doug McGuff. But in terms of the people who are teaching this now, like this, it, it's kind of just me and Drew Bay at the moment. Um, all the old collegiate and uh, professional strength conditioning coaches, they're all long, long retired. Where you have to learn it from is me. You have to join my VIP coaching. Click the link in the description. Join my coaching, and I'll coach you and teach you all of this. We do two group calls a week. They're two hours long. They're all recorded. If you want to be a good trainer and learn this, I will teach you. Otherwise, you're probably spend a decade trying to find this stuff on your own. So that's what I would do. I learned a lot of what I know. I had good mentors. I knew people who had been in this for decades and decades, twice as long as I've been alive. Um, um, uh, Drew Bay, um, lots and lots and lots of books, but I spent the last decade learning this stuff. So if you want to learn it in an accelerated way, instead of on your own for a decade, join my VIP coach and click the link in the bio um, or description. And I will teach you. I have lots of trainers in my coaching who are now applying this to their clients, and building their business. I've been taking steps to failure, feeling sore the next few days, but I feel smaller and weaker through this is normal, adjust my head. Have you adjusted your volume and frequency? You can't just start taking all of your sets to failure and training five days a week and doing three, four, or five sets. You're going to overtrain. All right. So when you are increasing intensity, you have to reduce volume and frequency. If you don't, you will overtrain. So you may be <laughs> smaller and weaker because you're overtraining. You really need to learn how to dial that in. Um, and that's what, uh, that's, that's what my coaching is for, teaching you how to dial in volume and frequency, exercise selection, stuff like that. Do you think it's possible to practice training to failure in a home gym? Yes. 
Also, what are your thoughts on J-Flex CrossFits for bodyweight training with suspension straps? I don't know what they are, but suspension straps are a far less than ideal tool um, when it comes to training your muscles. I, I would. A home gym, all you need is a power rack, squat rack, bench press, some weights. You could do – you can train your entire body with power. I don't recommend getting things like the suspension straps and stuff like that. It's far from optimal. But I have in my home workout, which is free if you get Golden Air System today, go to goldenairsystem.com. My home workout shows you tons of exercises you can do for all the major muscle groups with minimal equipment or body weight. So you can do it. Um, it's you're, you're usually better off in a gym because the, the equipment is a tool that helps you contract your muscles harder. What's your opinion about group classes and commercial gyms? Are they useful just as social gathering events? Um, okay. Anything that places a demand, that places a demand on your muscles is going to be effective. The problem with group classes is that although it may have, they don't place a high enough demand on your muscles and your body will adapt to them and get used to them. So they don't create the, the purpose of exercise is strengthening activity. This is what Drew Bay calls it. Exercise is strengthening activity. It makes your muscles stronger. Anything that makes your muscles stronger is exercise. Okay. Group classes don't. They are going to, you're going to use your muscles which is going to get a lot of blood flowing through your body, lots of blood flowing through to different muscles, which is going to increase your heart rate, increase your breathing rate, which is going to give you the appearance of exercise. But it's only because you're using a lot of muscle. You're not stimulating a lot of muscle. Will there be an exercise-like side effect from this? Yes. But it's about as efficient as washing your car with a fucking toothbrush. It's horrible. Group classes are only effective in the beginning. They will not make you stronger, generally, because they're not progressive either. How can you make a group class progressive? You don't. All right, you've said that static stretching doesn't improve flexibility more than strength chaining. I didn't say that. The research said that. Does that mean if I want to be able to do split, static stretching won't help? We're talking about general flexibility. We're not talking about uh, a split is a very specific thing you're doing with your body. There are some activities which may require excessive ranges of motion. So when the subjects were tested on flexibility, they weren't tested on their ability to do a split. That's very excessive. So if you're doing things like uh, kicking in Muay Thai or doing a split, you're going to need to stretch to teach your body to go into those positions. All stretching is, really, is passive tension, which teaches your nervous system to allow for more range of motion. So if you want to be able to do a split, you need to train your nervous system to allow for that range of motion. Um, completely different. All right. Which specific muscle groups need isolation training that are not adequately addressed during the compound exercises like big five? Calves, forearms, neck. Abdominals, lower back. You absolutely want to train your forearms and your calves. They're not going to be adequately addressed. Um, other than that, you pretty much cover everything. Is training to failure for beginners? If not, then how many years of training? Training to failure. There's, there's no. See, and this is another. So. Oh, why did I delete the, the New Year video? Well, because New Year's is over. I didn't realize it was a good video, but New Year's was over, so I deleted it. Training to failure, there, there isn't in the belief that there's beginner routines, advanced routines, and that for some reason, um, more advanced trainees need more complicated routines or harder workouts. It's just false. Training to failure is simply... Carrying a set to the point where your muscles can no longer produce force. And when you get it to that point, you have recruited 
and stimulated every available muscle fiber. That's why you fail. Um, this is going to result in the best stimulus. Anybody can do it. I've had young girls with Down syndrome trained to failure. I had um, a guy, Joe, with MS in a wheelchair trained to failure. Anybody can. You should. <sighs> All right, Drew Bay recommends suspension trainers for his Kratos body weight workout. If you want, if you want like a body weight Kratos, an all body weight workout, do Drew Bay's. Um, my home workout has some body weight exercises, but it's got a lot of um, static exercises and um, exercises you can do with minimal free weight. So, all right, so let's look into another. Oh, okay, quickly. Before I go on to the next one, can you talk a bit about calves training is important to do a slow full range of motion? You do not need a full range of motion for anything. Do you want to know why? Because muscles do not produce movement. Muscles produce force. Okay. When the amount of force the muscle produces is greater than the resistance it's contracting against, you have movement. Okay. So if I put my hand here and I contract my muscles hard, the amount of force my muscles producing is greater than the amount of force my hand is providing or the amount of resistance my hand is providing. So I have movement. When the amount of force is equal to the resistance the muscle is contracting against, you don't have movement. When the amount of resistance that the muscle is contracting against is greater than the amount of force the muscle can produce, you have negative movement. Okay. Muscles don't produce movement, they produce force. Whether or not your limb moves or you produce movement depends on the amount of resistance the muscle's working against. With that said, do you need range of motion? No. Because you simply need to contract the muscles against resistance. <clears throat> Enough to get the nervous system to recruit a high level of motor unit. So a very short range of motion is all that is required to stimulate a muscle. You don't need the muscle to move. You don't need the muscle to permit movement to recruit fiber. If I sit here, if I sit here and hold this weight like this, are my muscles working? Yeah. They're getting tired. Am I moving? No. The fibers are being recruited and the fibers are working regardless of movement. If the goal of exercise is to recruit fatigue fibers and the fibers are being recruited and fatigued while I'm statically holding the weight, then it's obvious that movement is not required. <clears throat> do you find some people need more time in between each workout? Absolutely. Something like week one, Monday, Friday, week two. Yes. You need to adjust your frequency based on your ability to recover. This is something I teach in my coaching. All right. So if you haven't joined my coaching, click the link in the description, book a call with me. Um, these are all the nitty gritty details I teach. All right. Let's go into another one of, the, one of these here. All right. What's another position stand? Multiple sets. Everyone loves this, right? Multiple sets, number 12. Let's see. Page 12. Multiple set. Okay. This is the hot topic right here. The position stand claims that several studies reported multiple set programs superior to single set programs in previously untrained subjects. Untrained subjects in long term six month studies and resistance trained individuals. However, close examination reveals that most of the studies cited do not support the claim that multiple sets are better. Let's look at the first one. This is something that some people are never going to accept because they're so indoctrinated into what a set is. When you think about it, what is a set? It's a predetermined number of times the weight moves up and down. But as I just explained, movement is not required to contract fatigue and stimulate muscle because muscles don't create movement. They produce force. 
that the amount of force the muscle is producing <laughs> is greater than the resistance, you have movement. If the amount of resistance is greater than the amount of muscle force the muscle can produce, you have eccentric negative movement. Okay. So obviously movement is not required. So what is a set? A set is the amount of times you move the weight. Well, if movement isn't required, obviously, then why do you need three sets? All right. So multiple set. Burger. Drew Bay talked about this one. I think his name is Richard Burger. Instructed nine groups of college-age males to perform the free weight bench press as part of their beginning weight training program using one of nine combination of sets. All these ridiculous things. There's no control for the number of sets or repetitions performed for any of the other exercises in the program, and the participants were not equated or randomized before training. Huge fucking problem. So only in the bench press, he changed all the combinations for the sets. When Berger combined his nine resistance training groups according to the number of sets performed, one, two, or three, he reported a significantly greater increase in one rep max bench press as a result of performing three sets compared with one set. So the increase in the one max bench press was 25% with the three sets, 22.3% increase with one set, 22% with two sets. So he reported significantly greater increase. But the problem is the difference between 22.3 and 25.5 is within the margin of error. That is not a significant difference. That is similar improvement. But he reported significantly greater increase when it only increased an additional 2.2%, 3.2%. That's within the margin of measurement error. It's a problem. There's no significant difference between the one, two set groups. <sighs> okay. Using an analysis of covariance to test for any significant interaction between sets and repetitions, Berger noted that his training with one, two, or three sets in discrete combination with two, six, or 10 repetitions was not systematically was not systematically more effective in improving strength than other combinations. Berger recorded no significant interaction, but then concluded that the combination of three sets and six repetitions was more effective. So what actually happened is in Berger's study, he reported no significant difference between one, two, or three sets, but then concluded that three sets of six was the most effective. Why? Why did he do that? Some people think that he was uh, afraid to go against the grain of what most people believed. In fact, Berger reported no significant difference in the magnitude of strength gains in seven out of his nine comparisons. So out of all the nine groups, seven were identical. Thus, this seminal study by Berger, which is frequently cited in support of multiple sets, shows that the majority of outcomes do not even favor multiple sets. It's weird. I'm telling you, I don't know what's going on here, but when you actually look at the studies, so the ACSM, they provide the curriculum for university level um, exercise education, exercise degrees, personal training certifications, strength conditioning certifications. They support three sets, but the studies they provide do not. And then they go into all the other studies, Sanborn, Stone, Stowers. They go into all the other studies that um, the ACSM used to support the position span, stand of multiple sets and prove that none of these studies actually support them. It's messed up. It's messed up. I, you know, I don't know why. This is going on. Who knows? Um, but the thing is, it's like, you know, on the vast, based on the majority of the research, you can get the same exact results doing one or two sets, two or three workouts a week. Is somebody doing six workouts a week doing three sets? Why would you do more? It's because you're indoctrinated. I could shove all this evidence in your face 
half of the people, it won't, it won't penetrate. But that's okay. Then keep doing it. For the people who don't have a lot of time, people who have other obligations, this is for you. You'll get the exact same results. Training half the frequency, half the volume. One third the frequency, one third the volume. <clears throat> How many seconds should a set last under tension? Um, 30, 220, doesn't matter. Does HIT training help stimulate tendon repair? Like when trying to recover from tendonitis? Actually, yes, it does. Um, <sighs> it does, but there's a very specific way you're going to want to go around it. It depends on, you know, it depends on the individual. It's something I teach in coaching too. Um, in general, yes, but can I give you exact recommendations on how to do it? No, it depends. Sets are a nicer way to say I can't leave the gym because I'm bored. Yeah, pretty much. All right. Is it enough? What, 10 to 12 sets per one hit training? It's too general. It depends on what muscle groups you're training. depends on what exercise you're doing. You can't just say 10 to 12 sets because I don't know what those sets include. The industry controls the narrative. Yes, sir. That's what it is. And as you guys notice, I mean, is media – as the media is changing now and there's kind of less censorship, especially with things on YouTube, you can tell there's narratives for, for everything. Um, I don't, you know, Drew Bay might know more than I, I, I don't know the purpose of the narrative for promoting these traditional training techniques, especially things like power training. So let's go over power training. So, so if you guys want to read this paper, please do. Please do. Your, your, your mind will be blown if you read this paper. You'll learn more about exercise from this paper than any certification, anything. It's called the Critical Analysis of ACSM Position Statements. Okay? Check that out. Um, let's talk about power training. Okay? So a lot of people think you need to train to improve power. Okay? What is power? In physics, power is the amount of work done divided by time, okay? Um, for instance, like an engine, how many revolutions, um, RPNs, the engine makes, rep uh, revolutions per minute, RPM, the engine makes, is power. Power involves movement. Power involves work. So... You cannot improve, if you want to improve a muscle's power, you have to improve its strength, the amount of force it produces. You can't, by moving, a lot of people think that by contracting weight more quickly, you're going to improve your body's ability to contract its muscles with more power or more quickly. So consider this. Arthur Jones made a good example. Say your max bench press is 100 pounds and you just barely get it up. An individual might be able to bench press 100 pounds in three seconds. Okay, so say your max bench press is 100 pounds. You go to bench press 100 pounds, it takes you three seconds to complete it. Now, say that same individual doubles his strength. His max bench press goes from 100 pounds to 200 pounds. So now he's able to bench that 200 pounds, but it still takes him three seconds because it's his max bench. How fast can he now bench 100 pounds? So he doubled his strength. His old one rep max will now take him half the time it did in the beginning since he doubled his strength. So while previously it took him three seconds to bench 100 pounds, he's increased his maximum strength to be able to bench 200 pounds. He can now bench 100 pounds in 1.5 seconds. Now say the individual increases his max bench to 400 pounds. Okay. Previously, he was only able to bench press 100 pounds. It took him three seconds to move it. Now he can bench 400 pounds. It takes him three seconds to move it. 
Now he can bench 100 pounds in 0.75 seconds. See how this works? The stronger you get, the more power you have. Here's another good example. Like just, just consider, you just start weight training. You could do 30 pounds on the curls, barbell curls for 10 repetitions, meaning you try to get 11 and you fail. You just start off training, you can only do 30 pounds. You've been training for a year. Now you can do 70 pounds for 10 repetitions. Think of how much faster you're now able to move 30 pounds. That's an increase in power. So what is influencing your increase in power? It's an increase in strength. And you do not need to move quickly to increase strength. Your ability to lift a weight quickly will not transfer to your ability to do anything else quickly. The only thing that improves your ability to do something quickly is strength. Consider the amount of force your muscles can produce. So say my say I'm, I'm contracting against something that, pro, that produces 50 units of force and I get stronger and now I can, and, and my muscle can produce more force. Now I can move that 50 units of resistance quicker. Power, skill, the more efficient you become in a particular activity, the more power you're going to be able to exhibit. Skill. So power isn't even, you know, the thing about power and power training is like it doesn't even have a definition. In, in, in physics, power is work over time. But what is power in exercise? What is it? <laughs> it doesn't even make any sense. All right, let's see. Doing the program for months, seeing great results. Right on, man. Right on. <clears throat> yeah, if you if you do my program, you will see way better results than anything you've ever tried with way less time in the gym. Why? Because it's based off of physiology. Even the guy who popularized power training in the West, Yuri Berkotchensky, said to focus on improving strength in order to improve power. <laughs> it's so... I know, guys. It's so funny. And Brad Schoenfeld, I don't know what the hell the guy's thinking. It's so weird. He recommended, he, he posted something on Twitter, and Drew Bay told him he should be embarrassed for recommending it. He published a paper, a meta-analysis, that said elderly individuals should do power training, meaning he suggested elderly people should lift weights fast. Is that not the craziest fucking thing you've ever heard? That's how batshit insane some of these people are. All right, forget the pins. Yeah, clapping push-ups for your grandma. It's so fun. Like, <laughs> an elderly individual, they can't even mow their own lawn. And you're going to have them go in a gym and do a deadlift quickly? That's absolutely insane. All right, dips versus weighted push-ups. Which one is better for the chest? Weighted push-ups. Did you go to the Arnold Sports Festival? No, completely missed it. Maybe next year. All right, when training a targeted muscle, should the force come from the targeted muscle to make the weight that we are using to move? Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's the point. The point of an exercise is to have the target of muscle contract against resistance. So we want to place resistance on the target of muscle. How do we place resistance on the target of muscle? Well, we have to figure out the function of that muscle. Let's take, we'll take the lateral head of the deltoid, for instance. The lateral head of the deltoid, its primary function is humeral abduction. This. Humeral head, or lateral head of the deltoid, humeral abduction. So we want to place resistance against that muscle's function in order to get it to work, in order to, to create fatigue in it. How do we do that? Well, we put a weight in our hand. We just contract. We find the function of the muscle. 
and we add resistance and contract its function against resistance. You can use a dumbbell, you can use a band, you can push against the wall, it really doesn't matter. So the goal of the exercise is to place resistance against the target muscle's function. So when training the target muscle, should the force come from the target muscle? Yes, that's the point. All right. Do lats get good activation even when you don't feel them and pull down using neutral grip? Yes. I've gone over this a few times. Um, just because you don't feel a muscle does not mean it is not being effectively worked. So you have a lot more sensory nerves and sensory input in your limbs, in your arms, legs. You're going to feel the muscle groups in your arms and legs a lot more than the muscles in your torso. Because our arms and legs have a lot more sensory nerves in them for proprioception, for being able to find our body in space. We don't bang our chest and our back into things to find our body in space. We use our arms to feel around. That's why we have more sensory nerves. So the reason you don't feel the muscles in, in your torso as much is because of less sensory input, less sensory nerves. So you could be doing an ex uh, extremely effective lax exercise and not necessarily feel it because there's less sensory nerve endings in there. Now, let's see. Have you ever heard the term loading reflex? Seems that if load is completely static, pushing while our nervous system is more inhibited and self-regulating since it does not have an emergency need to generate more force and would diminish our strength output. Um, that, yeah, maybe, maybe. That's why if you're doing statics, it's better to have a coach. And this is also why I recommend just using weight. There, there could be truth in that. I just intuitively feel that people's gains will be better. Statics work, but you have to do them properly. And this may be something that inhibits your ability to do them properly. All right, how is the lateral head of the deltoid working effectively during overhead press? Remember, <laughs> lateral head, humeral abduction, okay? Now, if I'm doing an overhead press, what's happening to my humerus? Look, it's abducting. Abduction is taking the upper arm. Humeral abduction is simply taking the upper arm and pulling it away from the body. If I'm doing an overhead press, the upper arm is being pulled away from the body, isn't it? A lot more involvement of the um, anterior deltoid, though. Our farmers carries a, a time static contraction exercise. Yeah, I mean, without if you're not walking with them, it's very silly to walk with them. If you're going to do farmers carries for your forearms, just stand there until you can't hold them anymore. There's no, no reason to walk with them. All right, let me answer this one. I missed a couple times. Is the 4-4 cadence just a recommendation for safety reasons? Yes. Would it be fine if I did 2-4? Yes. Um, rep range doesn't matter. Just keep it slow because we want to avoid something called shearing forces. And Mark Asanovich, if you guys haven't seen the video, the interview of me and Mark Asanovich, he explains shearing forces. So if I hold a weight like this, I have pulling force this way and this way. So my tendon is literally being pulled like this. That is called shearing forces. As the weight increases, the more weight I hold, the more shearing forces I have. The faster I move, the more shearing forces I have. So the purpose of moving slow is to reduce the amount of shearing forces so you do not screw up your tendons and ligaments. You just need to move relatively slowly. Um, slower is not better, faster is not better. All right. Oh, have you increased your creatine intake to assist in your sprint training? If so, um, no, I haven't. Honestly, the only thing I've done for sprint training is just practice sprint training. I've only practiced it twice. <laughs> because I just, I don't know, either I'm tired or overtrained or whatever. I haven't gotten over there. 
But by the second time, the second practice, I was significantly faster. And I think I did about 25 or 30 10 yard sprints. And I was barely tired. Just to prove you don't need cardio. You don't. What are your thoughts on Nordic hamstring curls or replacement for seated hamstring curls? Certain movements train connective tissue more effectively. Nope, that's completely fucking wrong. Absolutely insane, bullshit nonsense. Connective tissue. If you strengthen a muscle, the connective tissue indirectly associated with that muscle will get stronger. It's got partially to do with loading the muscle, but it's got mostly to do with something called myokines. When you train a muscle hard, the muscle becomes inflamed. It releases cytokines called myokines, which cross talk to the connective tissue and tell the connective tissue to increase in strength and thickness and toughness. Um, it's got mostly to do with myokines, very little to do with the movement. It's got to do with overall strengthening activity. It's got nothing to do. So anyone who says certain movements make your connective tissue stronger versus others, um, they're clueless. They have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. <clears throat> okay, let's see. I only have a rack, a bench, an Olympic barbell at home, so I've been doing rows, bench, and squats. Is that enough to reach my full potential? No, not your full potential. You'll get tremendous results doing that, but is it going to be your full potential? No, absolutely not. Do you agree with Mike Mentor's 60% carbohydrate intake and nutritional advice? The macronutrients breakdowns are irrelevant. Um, it comes down to calories and pretty much protein intake. So, no, I don't agree with any of Mike Menzer's dietary recommendations. Um, his recommendations are 35 years old. We've learned a lot since then. Golgi tendon organs and muscle spindles. Yeah, that's got part to do with it, but most of it. So when you are when you are loading the muscle like that, there is going to be an effect on the Golgi tendon organs and the muscle spindles in the connective tissue. But again, most, most of it, most of that increase, again, it, it's coming from the myokines. It's coming from the release and the, uh, the release of the myokines when you fatigue your muscles deeply. All right. But of course, the mechanical loading is going to affect it. But here's the thing. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a better idea if you're going to be loading these tendons to load them with less shearing force, less damage to them. All right. Uh, let's see. I'm going to go a couple more minutes. Guys, the home workout and arm program come free today if you get a golden air system. If you're a new person and you haven't tried the system, it's going to walk you through doing this training on your own. All right. Instead of watching through all these videos and trying to figure out which exercise is good for this, which is good for that. What should my workout look like? The Golden Air System shows you exactly what to do. Just get that. It's 47 bucks. You get three programs for 47 bucks. Don't try to figure out high intensity training on your own by spending hours watching a video. Just get the program and it's going to show you exactly what to do. Do you think communism has something to do with the corruption of the fitness industry? No. No, I think it's just a slippery slope of shitty recommendations that they can't go back on. Why do forearms fail before lats, even when using a neutral grip? They don't. Your forearms don't fail before your lats. Your forearms have more sensory nerves in them, which causes them to burn more, giving you the illusion they fail before your lats, but they do not. When you say 30 to 120 seconds for time and retention, how would I know exactly which is best? Richie Rich, get the golden era system. It explains all of this. I've explained this a million times, and I have this explained perfectly in the golden era system. Just get that system, and it's going to answer most of your questions. All right. If you guys want to work directly with me in my coaching program, my unlimited coaching program, I'll dial in, teach you how to dial in your training, your diet, etc. Get you the best results you've ever seen. Click the link in the description for the VIP mentorship. If you haven't tried Golden Air System, go to goldenairsystem.com and get the home workout and the arm program for free today.
Okay. For all, all the new people, if you haven't tried the system, you know, get the system is going to show you exactly what to do for a workout. So you can go and do this and start seeing results. All right. You're going to have a lot of questions, but the system answers all of those questions through a bunch of different videos. It's got it all in a row answers all of them. All right. Things like time under load, how to construct your workout, how to dial in volume, how to diet. This is all explained in the golden air system. So if you're new, you just found this content and you're like, well, this is cool and want to figure out how to do this. This tells you exactly what to do. Or you can go watch a gazillion old live streams if you have a shitload of time on your hands, but I don't recommend it. All right. That's it for me. Like subscribe, get the arm workout on the, the home program free. Um, and follow me on Instagram. That's where I share all the reels and all the cool stuff. All right. Adios.